Let's say a short prayer before we read our Father in heaven. Um, Lord, these are your words to each one of us. And uh, Lord, we're in different places in our walk with you. We need to be challenged in different ways today. So Lord, please take uh, the words that I've prepared and Lord, apply them to us, each according to our needs, so that you are building each of us up today. In the name of Jesus, amen. Proverbs 3, 1 through 12. My son, do not forget my teaching But let your heart keep my commandments. For length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. And do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways, acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Then your barns will be filled with plenty, and your vats will be bursting with wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline or be weary of his reproof, for the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. And that's our passage for today. So today, humility is a fading virtue, or one that at least seems to be fading in a lot of ways. There's a lot of different virtues that uh, you acquire if you're following Jesus. Humility is one of them. Peace is another one. Joy, self-control, gentleness, patience, temperous kindness, kindness. Humility is a big one, though. And so it's good that we are talking about it today. And humility is something that kind of seems to be on its way out, or it's kind of fading. And there's at least a couple ways that we can see this. One way is that many are disregarding religion altogether. People are just kind of saying, yeah, I don't believe really in in anything. There's no real religion that I have. And um, that just kind of makes us the center of our own universe a little bit. If there's no God that we worship or no community of believers that we belong to, then we're kind of just on our own and we kind of just make it up ourselves. You can see the, the progression in 2007, there were two, 2% were atheists, 2% agnostic, and people who just said nothing were 12, and then 2021, atheists had doubled, agnostics had more than doubled, and nothing is up to 20%. The full chart is on the right there. There's, there's a going away of religion right now, and people are becoming more of the center of their own universe than they were before. And there's going to be more on this next week. I'm going to talk about, talk about just kind of this, this trend in general and why that might be the case and what that would mean for us as a church. So I want to encourage you to come back next week. Today also, in addition to just disregarding religion, many people are just trusting in their own understanding. We're, we're kind of just throwing off uh, the advice from, from experts and other things like that. We, we figure it out ourselves. Few people are seeking advice. Most people are doing their own research. And I tried to blow up this graphic as highly or as much as I could for those of you who can't read that. Um, people who rely a lot on different sources when making uh, major life decisions, their own research uh, was the highest for, for, uh, across the board. Uh, prayer and religious reflection was, was um, oh man, I, I think I have those numbers reversed. 86% of those who are highly religious would say, yeah, I rely on prayer and religious reflection, but others, 29%. Family advice, not so much. Professional experts, even lower. Religious leaders, even lower. So, 
we rely on our own research and our own thoughts. We're relying on our own understanding right now. And this is just kind of a general trend. One person put it this way, in American life there has ultimately been a broad rejection of experts apart from the person searching for the answer on his or her own. So this is kind of the world we live in. We can figure it out ourselves. Our own judgment is best. And being wise in our own eyes, today many of us are just kind of generally independent in a lot of different ways. So we, we kind of don't work well with others very well. And we don't want to be identified with larger groups. That's kind of a liability. So just one, one example of this is uh, the amount of people who say that uh, they're Democrat or versus Republican you know, that's, that's, kind of, that's kind of steady, but people who just say they're independent, that's way up. Look at that. People don't want to be identified as Republican or, or Democrat. We're, we're independent because to be identified with a, with a bigger group, that's kind of a liability because we, we rely on our, ourselves. But even so politically, we're more independent. Religiously, we're more independent too. So uh, the next one there... There we go. If you look at all of the different kinds of churches out there, uh, non-denominational is really the only one that, that's really growing. People want to, don't want to be involved with a, a bigger group of, of believers. Even a lot of uh, churches that, that have denominations are kind of taking those names off. So some Christian Reformed churches don't, aren't called Christian Reformed Church anymore. You know, it's Alive Ministries, or it's Cottonwood Church, or something like that. We don't want to be associated with anything big. It's, it's cooler to be independent right now. This is kind of the, the world that we're living in. So there's just kind of this general trend. It, it's, it's better to be alone. It, there's kind of this I know better trend going on right now. But let's... Let's consider humility from Proverbs 3. The whole Bible teaches humility before God and others. This is kind of all over the Bible. I just picked one part that might, might talk about humility, but you can find this everywhere. Humility is, is a core doctrine and core practice of, of the Christian life. The, the converse is pride, and that's arguably the chief vice. Think thinking yourself superior or putting yourself before God and others, that's kind of where all kinds of bad things start. So humility is something that's pretty important. Verse 1, My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. We are to accept instruction. This is, this is what we are to do. We're supposed to take instruction. And this is all over the Bible. It's all over Proverbs. Um, there's, there's a lot of parts of Proverbs that, that applaud you for, for taking advice and receiving feedback or, or correction or reproof and, and just instead of being, you know, offended by that, but to take it, to take that, accept it. We're to accept instruction. On the bottom there, Psalm 25, 9, He leads the humble in what is right and teaches the humble His way. When, when you're humble, the Lord teaches you. Our Jesus at the close of the, the Sermon on the Mount, everyone then who hears these words of mine and does them will be like a wise man who built his house on the rock. If we listen to what Jesus has to say and then we do it, this is like building your house on a solid foundation as opposed to a foundation of sand. Accepting instruction is, is something that we're to do. In verses 1 and 2 together there, it says, it says my, my son, my son. This is a, this is a parent talking to, talking to a child, okay? Now, there's some kids here. This is kind of especially for you. Um, mom and dad might not know everything. That, that's true. But they have seen and lived many hard lessons in life. They've, they've been there and, and done a lot. And they've seen other people 
make their own mistakes, and, and so they know something. And they have a lot of experience, and the voice of experience is always worth listening to. They know stuff. It's worth hearing them out. Just a little bit ago, we heard, honor your father and your mother. There's a reason God says this. Mom and dad know something. We're supposed to honor them. Hear what they have to say. It doesn't mean they're perfect or they're always right, but they do know stuff. That's uh, one of Deirdre's favorite lines for me whenever I, I'm surprised that she knows something about football or, or geography or something that I know something about. And her line is, I know stuff. Mom and dad, they know stuff. They're good people to listen to. Even if you think you know better, mom and dad probably know better than you. Verse 3, let not steadfast love and faithfulness forsake you, it says. These are two key words here, actually, for God's character. Steadfast love and faithfulness, this is, these are key words to describe God. So, God's character is one of steadfast love. Not love that's fickle here and there, and every, but no, it's steadfast, it's constant. And God is faithful. He doesn't give up on us like we would give up on others. He perseveres. He continues on. So in Exodus 34, 6, when God passed before Moses, we studied this passage uh, just a month or two ago, uh, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and faithfulness. Also in Psalm 25, 10, for one other, there's a bunch of others, Besides these, these, this is who God is. So what this is telling us to do here, essentially, it says to bind them around your neck and write them on the tablet of your heart. Okay, God's, take God's attributes and then put them out around your neck and on your heart. Wear God's character around your neck, put it in stone on your heart. You know, when something is in stone, you can't erase that. It's pretty, pretty solid in there. So, take God's attributes and put them in stone on your heart. Like, it's not going to go away. And wear it around your neck, like proudly for, for all to see. Just put God's character out there. Wear it. So, there's a within and a without. Take God's character upon yourself. And then verse 4, So you will find favor and good success in the sight of God and man. Humble obedience will give you favor with God and respect from others. Humble obedience will win you respect from others and favor with God. If you're a humble person who, who follows instructions, people respect that. People appreciate that. And most of all, God appreciates that. He respects that. God esteems the one who just trusts Him enough to obey Him. People respect others who are not just pers pushing their, their own agendas or manipulating others. In psychology, there's this whole thing called emotional intelligence, which basically says that if you know how to get along with others and follow instructions, you are much more likely to have success in life than if you have a super IQ. Getting along with others and knowing how to work on a team, follow instructions, these are important qualities for a successful life. Proverbs knows what it's talking about. God knows what he's talking about through Proverbs. Verse 5. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and do not lean on your own understanding. I know that there's at least some of you out there who have memorized this verse before. This is a good one. Basically, trust God and not your own understanding. God knows more than you do. More than any of us knows. It's good to, to hear what he has to say and, and do that instead of what I think is right or what I think is best. God knows better. He always knows better. The beginning of sin is not trusting God's goodness and knowledge. Really, if you don't trust that God is good 
or that he knows what he's talking about, that's the beginning of pretty much all sin, or at least all the sin that I can think of. So basically, God knows more than me. That's, that's the key thing here. And God wants the best for me. When the serpent deceived Eve in the garden, the key thing there was kind of, you know, God is holding out on you. He's, he's actually keeping back something from you. You know, he, he doesn't want you to be like him because then you might know good and evil. And he doesn't want that. He wants to keep you down. If you, if you think that God doesn't want the best for you, then you start to think, I need to find my own way. We need to trust that God not only knows what he's talking about, but that he actually does want the best for us when he gives us his commands. And if we really believe this, we would always obey him. Our problem is, is that our, our faith is kind of weak. This is one of Jesus' recurring uh, complaints about his disciples. Have you still so little faith? Oh, you of little faith? He said that a lot. Come on, guys, really? How many miracles do I have to perform so you learn to trust me? Our faith is weak. Verse 6. In all your ways, acknowledge him and he will make straight your paths. This is, uh, I kind of give my own translation here that I think captures it a little, little bit better. In all you do, know him and he himself will clear your path. Know him in everything that you do. And he is going to move, remove those obstacles out of your path. So more than just simply acknowledging him, like just this little hat tip, hey, thanks God. More than that, this is have him in mind with your every decision. Your whole life, all your decisions, have him in mind. Knowing him in all that you are doing is what this is about. And when you do that, he is going to clear obstacles out of your path. That's what he does. I'm sure that God has cleared a lot of obstacles out of my path that I didn't even know were there, that I would have tripped on, and, but he cleared it away before I got there. This is how God works. And seven, be not wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. I, I kind of like that verse. In other words, your opinion is wrong. Always obey God. Whatever your opinion is, it's wrong. God's the one you need to listen to. Always obey him. Do what he says. Whatever you're thinking, if it's different than what he's thinking, it's wrong. Drop it. Forget about it. It's wrong. If there's ever any thought that, hey, maybe I should just disobey this one time. Nope, that's wrong. Well, maybe God didn't think about this situation that I'm in right now when he gave this. Nope, that's wrong. If, you, if your thoughts go anywhere that would lead you to disobey God, it's wrong. Just, just assume that. Don't be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord, turn away from evil. Your opinion is wrong. Don't follow your heart, follow God. Verse 9, honor the Lord with your wealth and with the first fruits of all your produce. Give your best to the Lord, is what this says. The first fruits, that's like, that's the first pickings of, of the harvest. You, you, give what, from, you give to God what you get first. And this is more than just about money. It's about all, everything that we have, really. And so that means that we need to give God the best of our time, the best of our energy, as well as our money, but even our attention. Do we give God the best of those things? Or do we give him the leftovers? If you run, if you, if you run out of time during the day and you, and you miss devotions, then you're giving, giving God the leftovers. You need to give God the best, the best of your time, the best of your attention. God doesn't just want our money. He's not a bill collector. He's a father. He wants a relationship. 
And that's why the command is not just obey God. It's love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, which includes obedience, but he wants more than that. He doesn't just want us to fear him. He wants us to love him too. Now, you have to put food on the table, and there's nothing wrong with enjoying good things in life, but giving to God comes first. Giving to God comes first. Give God the best part of your day. Read a short passage and pray. Whether you're, if you're a morning person, make God that part of your day. Give Him just that little bit of time. If you're a night person, then give Him that part of your day. Whatever part of the day that you have, give Him your best. Give Him your best. God doesn't want our leftovers. I mean, try... Try having a marriage or, or your kids where you just give them the leftovers of your time. That doesn't work very well. It's kind of insulting. Give God your best. Giving first fruits is an act, actually, to acknowledge that all we have is God's. Everything that we have is God's. Every second that we're alive is because God kept us alive. Every breath that we take is because God enabled us to take it. All the money that we have is because God enabled us to to make it. All the people that we have around us is because God put them there for us. We need to acknowledge that all that we have is God's. Like in verse 6, And all that you do, know Him. Have Him in mind always. There's nothing that we have that God didn't give us directly or enable us to get ourselves. So just one thought for you. This is more than just money, but just I'm going to use a money example here. If you, what you give financially is, is between you and God. I don't, I don't know what anybody gives in this church, and I'm glad that I don't, that the deacons handle all the money here, and I'm glad about that. Um, but I just want to throw this out there just as for a spiritual practice for you. If you give after taxes, you're actually giving the government your first fruits. The government gets your money before God does. Do you want the government having your first fruits? Or do you want God to have your first fruits? It's something to think about. A recurring thing here. In this passage, verses 6, 8, and 10. It's God who gives you health and wellness. These all come from God. These are not givens. He doesn't owe them to us. We don't owe them to ourselves. These are not givens. This should give us a little humility. All all of the health that we have and all the strength that we have, the, the fact that we can be here today is because God enabled us to. You should have a little humility about that. Tomorrow is not a guarantee for for any of us. We need to have some humility, recognize that every new day is a gift from God. One thing that I've noticed as I've uh, met with people who are older over the years is that there's quite a few of them that as they get to be older, they start to realize this a little more than, than the rest of us. It's, there's, there's a lot of older people in this church or have gone through this church who wake up every day and, and thank God for another day. Because they start to realize that every day is really a gift. Now, when you're young and stupid like me, and maybe a lot of us, you kind of take every day as a given. And your health the next day is a given. But really, it's not. It's not. This is from God. And then verse 11 talks about difficulties. We are going to experience difficulties in life. God removes obstacles, but he doesn't remove everyone all the time. So what about that? When difficulties come, take it as either God's fatherly training or his correction. Maybe there's something you need to change in your life. Maybe... You just need to trust him more. 
One thing that is all throughout the Bible is that God is not mean, he's not vindictive, he's not spiteful. That is not who God is. But he is a heavenly father and he wants to train us to trust him. That's what he wants. And unfortunately for us, the goal is not to make things easy or to make things comfortable. So if you're going to follow Jesus, having things easy and comfortable is not the object here. If God gives those things to you for a while, that's great. Enjoy that. But that's not a given. Sooner or later, God is going to say, I need you to take the next step in faith now. Here you go. At least that's been my experience. And just looking out there at a lot of you, I, I know that this has been a lot of your experiences too. If you have good times, enjoy those. But every once in a while, God is going to say, I need you to take the next step of faith now. Here you go. It's not going to be comfortable. It's not going to be easy. But I need you to trust me. I still want the best for you. I'm not doing this out of spite because I'm mean. I want you to trust me. Can you do that? Here you go. He wants us to train us to trust him. Hebrews 12 talks about this. Our fathers, our human fathers, disciplined us for a short time as it seemed best to them. But he, God, he disciplines us for our good, that we may share in his holiness. Let's uh, look at the screen here. Let's answer this question together. What do you understand by the providence of God? Providence is the almighty and ever-present power of God by which he upholds as with his hand heaven and earth and all creatures and so rules them that leaf and blade, rain and drought, fruitful and lean years, food and drink, health and sickness, prosperity and poverty, all things, in fact, come to us not by chance, but from his fatherly hand. This is a, this is a hard thing to, to lay hold of in difficult times. It is. But it is what the Bible teaches us. God is our Father and he's going to give us stuff that we don't want to do or go through. Verse 12, For the Lord reproves him whom he loves as a father, the son in whom he delights. God might not do what we want, but he does what is best. And we might not see it. We might not realize it. There's a number of times in each of our lives where we'll probably say, God, what in the world are you up to here? Because I can't see it. This doesn't make any sense to me at all. He might not do what we want, but he does what is best. And our challenge is to trust him humbly and with fear and reverence. It's actually the difficult times that make us like Jesus. It's not the easy times that make us like Jesus. He didn't have it easy. It's the hard times that make us like Jesus. It's the hard times that make us rely on the Lord more. I know that in my own life, it's at my lowest points when I've prayed the most, when I've studied scripture the most, when I've thought of God the most. And I hate that bad about myself. <laughs> it's like, come on, why can't I just get used to this? That's the way that we work, isn't it? God does what is best, and sometimes it's hard to trust him in that, but that's what we are called to do. So to wrap up here, let's humble ourselves before the Lord and he will exalt us in due time. As it says in 1 Peter 5, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time, he may exalt you. Let us learn to be humble in a time when pride seems to be a popular and on the rise thing. Let's trust in the Lord. Let's bow our heads. Lord God, our, our Heavenly Father, uh, Lord, you give us good times and you give us difficulties. 
Sometimes it's hard to trust you in those. Lord, sometimes it's easier to, to sin than to not sin. And so, Lord, we pray that we would not put our trust in ourselves, in our own judgment, in our own thoughts, that we would obey you, whether it's easy or hard, that we would put our trust in you, that you are doing what is best as a heavenly father, even when things are really difficult or when you don't make sense to us. Lord, teach us to trust you. In the name of Jesus, amen.